I got interested in food in a sort of strange mix uh, of accidents. I was a PhD student in social psychology looking at uh, why children don't go to school, looking at phobias, and got interested in the psychology of food, really. Why do people not eat and become anorexic. This was 45 years ago. Uh, but I was doing the research living in a semi-ruined farmhouse in the Yorkshire Dales and beginning to think about landscape and saying, why are these walls down? Why is this sheep? What's this land for? And to cut a long story short, I started getting interested in food and food and the environment was really my first motivation. This was in the early 1970s. And I realized there was an enormous politics to this. There was an enormous question of choice about how humans relate with nature and how we eat our food. And basically that tiptoed me into what we'd now call the food systems analysis. And uh, in the 1970s, I met up with other people. I was by then farming. I'd got more interested in farming in a sort of a, 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 a northern rundown sheep farming sort of landscape and was thinking about what could this be? And this was a time when food politics was all about the developing world. And I looked at the rich world and thought, what about us? Is this the future? Are we what's right? I think in the last 40 years, something very interesting has emerged from the new generation of food analysts or food policy analysts. It's that the model of thinking that we inherited from basically 1920s and 30s scientists when they took their chance in World War II to redesign the food system is now fatally flawed. Their argument was that the problem of food was that there wasn't enough of it. They looked at nature, they looked at the land, they looked at what we call now the environment and said, how can we manipulate it to get more food out of it? They saw the problem in rich countries like Britain, in the recession in the 20s and 30s, as one of hunger amidst immense wealth. This was the heart of the empire, Britain. People like Boyd Orr, John Boyd Orr, the first director general of the UN's Food and Agricultural Organization after the Second World War, was a doctor, a Scottish doctor in Glasgow, saying, this is appalling, there's rickets, what's going on? We must rethink the food system. This was a view that agriculture could and should answer the problems of public health nutrition. And their argument, that generation's argument, was, I still find it, very moving. It was humanitarian, egalitarian, wrapped around what we now call social justice. They said, let's produce more food. And if we produce more food, the price of food will come down. Michael Heisman, my colleague, and I summarised these arguments in our book, Food Wars. It's what we call the productionist approach to food policy. Produce more. And the answers of public health, hunger, social problems of maldistribution can be sorted out. This was a, a, a visionary, imaginative attempt to say, let's restructure the food system. One can trace those arguments way back. Their arguments that date back to the Victorian era of the, the new science, food chemistry, soil science, drainage, plant uh, development, animal breeding, all of these things are traceable to late 18th century, but mainly in the 19th century. But in policy terms, the key moment was that transition from the 30s to the 40s. And the Second World War was what gave the opportunity for that new insight, that vision, to become translated into reality. This great era, group of thinkers, of the 1930s and 40s, essentially ushered in, and I use a horrible word, a new paradigm. 
This is a word that's sometimes overused, but it means essentially a new framework, a new set of assumptions. Uh, instead of assuming that very hardline markets would determine whether you ate or not, whether you lived well or not, whether you lived longer or not, the paradigm shift, the framework shift said, if we produce more food, prices will come down, it'll be more affordable for ordinary working people, let alone the unworking, non-working people, the poor. And that vision, the food system change, was part of the welfare thinking that the neoliberals today hated, uh, that 35 to 40 years ago, when I started getting interested in food, were beginning to question. They were essentially questioning the neoliberals who now dominate political economy in food as in other areas. They were questioning the 1930s and 40s model, which had said, let the primarily the state governments set new frameworks, use subsidies to reshape the food system, to invest in land, to invest in training, to invest in a better food system, to produce more, to make food cheaper so that more people will eat better. And that model of food policy, the productionist model that Mike Heisman and I summarized in our book, Food Wars, uh, essentially worked, but by the 1970s was being questioned by the neoliberals who said this is nanny state, this is unnecessary, this is distorting markets. These are market fundamentalists who then became the new paradigm. Uh, and they have, to some extent, both dismantled and altered and watered down that productionist vision, but at another level, they've accelerated. They've said, let companies drive this. It's markets, the big drivers of this, cannot be governments or consensual activity across the food system, but the market dynamic between the consumer and the supplier, the consumer and increasingly the retailer. So from the 1970s, the supermarket model, the supermarket era, changes the power relations in the food system. And we get a new era, a new paradigm of market-led attempts to transform productionism. It's still productionism, but the people controlling it and the dynamics within it have been made both more complex and also more stretched. The power shifts from government to corporations. I don't want to demonize corporations, but they become the power brokers. In trying to analyze these shifts of the policy paradigms, it's important to try and realize how successful this has been. Shops filled, prices came down, people from low-income families began to be able to eat in a different way. There was more food. If you'd lived on very restricted, hand-to-mouth, literally that phrase means it, in, in the 1920s or 30s, to now walk into a hypermarket, it would seem fantasy world. These are cathedrals of choice. These are cornucopias. These are paradise in food terms. This choice, it's unbelievable. And yet it's there. So we must recognize, we 21st century critics of the modern food system, we must realize the great successes and, and not undo the humanitarian vision of the productionists. They had a goal of meeting social need, and they did. It did. The market dynamic-led changes of the 1970s onwards had a vision of more efficiency, cutting out unnecessary profiteering by unnecessary subsidies. Uh, their vision has dominated the success story of the food system in the 20th century. So what's the problem with this from the 1970s? We began to be aware that there were fundamental problems with this, actually.
the environment being one, international differences being another, and public health, I think, to some extent in particular. No one in the 1920s or 30s, let alone in the 1850s, had conceived of a world of overconsumption, had conceived of a world where diet would be the major cause of non-communicable diseases. And from the 1970s, the evidence began to build up enormously about diet's impact on public health, also on the environment. Although in the environment it was radical, marginal, supposedly fringe scientists beginning to raise this. In public health it was mainstream. These were the middle rank, middle of the road, public health, the epidemiologists saying, wow, diet is causing this growth of these diseases. And it's requiring totally different things. American soldiers killed in Vietnam in their late teens, early 20s, found with clogged arteries. What were they eating? What were they doing? This was the beginning of the lifestyle analysis of diet. Except it was about the success story. This was questioning the success story. At the same time, the beginnings of the argument about the environment, the great Rachel Carson saying in her Silent Spring in the early 1960s, saying the agrochemicals that have been part of this amazing armory of replacing labor, that's all agrochemicals are. They're replacing the hoers, the, the harvesters, the weeders on, on the field, and the fertilizers are replacing uh, the animals and, and green manures in farming systems that had allowed industrialization of farming to create cheap commodities to fill the supermarkets and allow the processors and manufacturers to produce cheap processed foods. And here in the 1970s, I'm blessed to have been uh, around at that time, uh, and seeing this evidence come out uh, from very different schools of thinking, sugar, salt products, all the story we now know uh, begins to emerge in the 1970s. So people like me were beginning to come together in groups, academic groups. Uh, I was in a, a group around the British Society for Social Responsibility and Science that was started as questioning the role of science a whole generation of academics emerged around those debates. And I was part of that. Uh, uh, and stopped farming, uh, uh, which I'd been doing, and concentrated on this. Uh, and that's been my working life, really, to try and help unpick that and to try to get our collective head, our heads around what's a good food system. At least the 1930s, people had a vision of what's a good food system. They said, let's produce more, let's make it cheaper, let's use nature, let's drain wetlands and irrigate drylands. Well, now we know that's draining water systems. We know agriculture is the biggest user of fresh water. We know that agriculture is the biggest impact that anything has on climate change. We know agriculture and food production and diet are the major factors and the major causes of non-communicable diseases. We know diet is the biggest factor in, in, in life expectancy. It's got more complicated. That's where we've got in the 21st century. The simplicity, the elegance, the beauty, the humanitarian appeal of productionism now looks not fit for purpose. Food policy left over from that era, even modified by the market moguls of the 1970s, the neoliberals, who said, leave it to market relations, allow consumers to determine. Well, what good is that in a world where advertising dominates the shape of culture, where the cultural rules have been changed? Food policy is now drifting. It's unclear what it should be doing. I'm an optimist, but yet the data are deeply, deeply, if not depressing, sober-making. My mother always said I was an optimist because I was a breech baby. I came out backwards. Even when the data are bad, I'm always thinking, well, how can we make something good out of this? Uh, but I have to say the data are terrible. Uh, the explosion of obesity, uh, 
There are 1.4, 1.5 billion people overweight or obese. Food's impact on climate change has been gone over by hundreds, thousands of scientists. If we don't sort out the food system, even at the agricultural level, we will not rein in climate change. The water threats from food, the biodiversity loss from food, these are, uh, you know, recipes for depression. So how can I be optimistic? Well, I am optimistic. I'm optimistic because we can read the writing on the wall. And you don't need a degree to read the writing on the wall. You can see the data and say, well, what do we want? Where are we going? And we're in a strange place at the moment in food policy internationally. At the UN level, this system of governments meeting uh, that was essentially born after the First World War, modified because it had been found wanting uh, in the Second World War, after the Second World War. Uh, that the UN system documents all of this. As I'm always saying, it counts the bodies falling over the cliff, but can't do much about preventing them falling over the cliff. At the company level, there's something very interesting going on. Big companies who are now the power brokers, the barons of the modern food system, with huge turnovers, bigger than countries in many cases, whose advertising budget, when I and a colleague, Jeff Rayner, did a study for the World Health Organization 10 years ago, looking at what were big companies in the food system doing to address public health. Uh, we found that one company, Coca-Cola's budget for advertising and marketing was bigger than the World Health Organization's entire budget for two years for the world. This is a distortion of power, an inequality of power. But yet those big companies are now beginning to look at the same data. And the beginning of the Coca-Colas and these soft drink companies whose business is basically to sell sugary water are saying, wow, water's a problem. So something very interesting is going on. It's not just nasty big companies and nice companies or nasty co uh, governments and nice governments or nasty consumers or nice consumers. It's not as simple as that. There's a, a gradual realisation that food policy needs a new direction, that it's complicated, that the messages are unclear. What do we think a good food system would be, what is a good diet? What's a good diet for health, environment, society, pleasure, culture? These are complicated questions, and the policymakers aren't addressing it, in my view. They're still reverting to the productionist default position, which is, well, let's sort out production. So right now we've got new technology, uh, supporters saying, well, technology will answer this. Well, genetic engineering, nanotechnology uh, will resolve the problem of more food so that we can all eat like Americans or eat like Europeans beyond environmental limits. Uh, and this will be the way forward uh, uh, around this notion of sustainable intensification, which actually can be good. A garden is sustainable but also intensive. It's producing a lot, but that's because you're giving it your free labour. How do you put that in a world which is urbanised, where the majority of the population, which is now 7 billion, going to be 9 billion by 2050, how do we produce more food from less land per person? The sheer geophysicality of the food system is reminding us of Malthus's problems in the late 18th century, where he said the capacity of population uh, to rise faster than the capacity to produce more food is the big problem, the Malthusian problem. And there's a sense in which modern food policy is in a sense being driven by a neo-Malthusian agenda of saying, we must carry on producing more to prove Malthus wrong. I'm someone who says, stop. Let's just have a proper think. What's the problem? Is it too much production, which is what I think it is? Is it malproduction? Yes. Is it underproduction? In some places, yes, but in other places, no. Is there enough to feed the world now? Plenty. Too much, actually. 
but is there enough to feed the world in an era of climate change in 20, 30 years ahead? Um, well, actually, that's not so certain. It gets messy. So we need to, I think, rethink the policy framework. We need to talk about a new paradigm. And that is beginning. That's why I'm optimistic. I'm hopeful because that discussion is bubbling up. It's not been translated yet into the UN world. It's not been translated into our national governments enough. But within governments, within companies, within sectors, within the consumer movement, within civil society, within the environment movement, within public health, these debates are beginning to emerge. That the old simplicity of productionism mark one 1930s and 40s, let alone productionism mark two of the neoliberal model, is no longer any good. And this all came to a head in the commodity and banking crisis of 2007-8. The questioning of the food system was bubbling along in a very serious way, but wasn't hitting the headlines. Uh, in policy terms. There'd been crises in the West in the 1990s about food poisoning and the, what we call the new adulteration. The public health arguments were bubbling up about heart disease. The rising concern about obesity really takes off in the 2000s. Uh, the environmental crisis, climate change, things like that, clearly bubbling up. I mean, very, very serious. The data getting very strong. But the policy engagement was not there until 2007-8 we saw this dramatic uh, commodity shift in prices. The banking crisis. Food and oil and banking go together. Food is a commodity. Food is something people make money out of. It's not just a power opportunity. It's not just the transformation of natural goods, plants, animals, into consumption. It's about money. And when the banking crisis happened, when Lehman Brothers went under, when the stock exchange and stock exchanges around the world went haywire, oil prices doubled, food prices doubled, world market prices doubled. Suddenly, the key indicator in financial terms, which was food prices coming down, went up. In the last 130 years, they've essentially come down. A blip in World War I, but then carried on coming down after it. A blip in World War II, but then carried on coming down. Then the first non-war blip, oil crisis of the early 1970s, but then carried on coming down. Although the, 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 the environmental and indeed some big business thought, whoa, this is early warning signs, the system's under strain. But the system went neoliberal and the market was reasserted. Uh, and here we had what many analysts said will be the same. OK, but the, we, this is another oil crisis, don't worry. Farmers will grow more, prices will then come down. 2009, they did come down. And so the, the market fundamentalists said, look, there it is. Well, I was working at the time with a, a team at, uh, or for a team at Chatham House, run by someone seconded from the Ministry of Defence, ironically. The rest of the British state wasn't interested in food, uh, particularly. They said, oh, this, we don't need to look at the future, it's all fine, we're OK. Uh, and when the commodity crisis, they all came crashing into this Chatham House working group. It was actually very amusing at one level. Uh, they said, can we join in? Because we were looking at scenario. What if this? What if that? And in that process, one began to see the enormity. I was a government commissioner uh, in, in uh, uh, the Sustainable Development Commission, an arm's length body advising the British government on sustainable development. I was the, the food man in that and I could see inside Whitehall, our street of government, suddenly pennies dropping, brains whirring. You think, my God, you mean the food system is in a crisis isn't about Africa, it's us? <laughs> 
this destabilization, volatility, because that's what the Chatham House Working Party was, uh, our research was pointing to, that there were different scenarios, never assumed there's a single line in history. It could go different ways, and we essentially thought volatility was going to be the new norm. You've got to remember, for 130 years, the dominant political economy was wrapped around trying to reduce prices, so that they would come down. More money to spend on cars, more money to be a consumer, more holidays, nice times for your kids. It's very positive. It's a consumer nirvana model. Very successful, as I keep saying. And suddenly it looks wobbly. Food prices going up, that's less money for, for clothes, for houses, for kids, for cars, for consumption, to damage the environment, to eat too much, to shift the burden of health care onto health insurance or, in the, uh, the case of uh, the social democratic countries, onto health services. This model is where we are. And so for after the 2007-8 commodity crisis, there was a serious moment when across the rich world, there began to be some really serious and interesting thinking about, do we need a better policy framework? Do we need to build a food system around sustainable development to have low-impact diets, to have low-impact farming systems, to reduce the unnecessary use of energy, oil, in shipping food around the world, flying food around the world, uh, getting us to travel further and further in our cars to go to a hypermarket on the edge of a town and then say, wow, isn't this cheap? Uh, and then being stuck in a traffic jam. That whole model began to look not so good. And it came to a head in that commodity crisis of 2007-8. But by the 2010s, the trillions of dollars, euros, all countries, currencies that have been thrown by governments, getting the state to subsidize the banking crisis aftermath, was being used to squeeze the state, to squeeze the public sector, whereas in fact it, the crisis was caused by the private sector. Uh, but in food terms, this was translated as a return to normality, the default position productionism, that we need uh, a technology-driven approach to food, that the system is basically fine, hypermarkets are great, keep eating the food that you've got used to, keep drinking the soft drinks, keep eating the highly processed foods, it's okay, but we've now got healthy niches. And if you want to pay a little bit more for that, it's your choice. Consumerism will deal with the problems of food. I think this is nonsense. The story that I've been saying is essentially one of mismatch. There's a mismatch of human bodies with the planet. There's a mismatch of policy in the food system. There's a mismatch of power. There's a mismatch of consumerism, us, uh, with the production system and supply chains. There is a mismatch inside the supply chains. The metaphor is very useful, I think, to log in our brains, mismatch. Where can policy help on this? There's mismatch between policy and all of this. And yet the data is getting stronger. The evidence that we cannot go on with this distorted food system, this fragile uh, system we've built up, it's a pack of cards, if you want another metaphor. It can fall down, and it looked like it was falling down in 2007-8, the commodity crisis. Well, there are hopeful directions. Firstly, I'm an optimist, people are realizing it. It's not just boring academics like me who see this. It's not just the civil society organizations. It's not just some people buried inside ministries. It's not just some people in boardrooms and in food companies. It's actually spreading across them. There's more cross-fertilization than I ever expected, actually. If you want a, a thin analogy, I would say we're in 1936. We've seen the crisis, we've experienced it, and no one's quite sure when the opportunity to restructure it is going to happen. There is a lot of plan B thinking going on, actually. Some plan A thinking going on as well. 
overt attempts to say, well, we must be nice to the environment. Let's put a bit of a, an edge around the field or let's have better pesticides or let's use water a bit better and use droplets and let, uh, dear consumer, please, will you eat better? Uh, that's all interesting. It's nibbling at the edges. But there isn't the big thinking. The big thinking that I think is, is needed is also beginning to bubble up. I'm astonished in the last four years, four years, how it right across the world, in rich countries, in poor countries, there's a realisation that the model, the Western-dominated model, productionism, ain't appropriate for China or India or Brazil. In Brazil, the very successful anti-hunger campaign for Mizero, uh, is now realising that Brazil is going through the nutrition transition. It's shifting its diet. It's doing an us, the rich world. And they're realising they can't afford it. The rich world can't afford the diet-related, non-communicable disease healthcare system. So when I was a government advisor, commission on the Sustainable Development Commission for, for Britain, formally advising and appointed by the Prime Minister, it, my last report before... The SDC, the Sustainable Development Commission, was abolished in 2011, at the end of March, was to say the model of thinking that was associated with Mrs. Brundtland, the Brundtland Report, the 1987 World Commission on Environment and Development, known as the Brundtland Report, uh, was no longer appropriate. They had argued it, that commission, Mrs. Brundtland had argued, Dr. Brundtland, she's a public health doctor, great woman, uh, first woman Prime Minister of Norway. They had argued that the future of sustainable development was uh, about linking up environment and, and economy uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, society. Uh, in food, that's too thin. It doesn't help us. And in my last report, I proposed that we had a six-heading approach to food policy. Quality. Who wants to eat lousy quality? What you think and I think of quality may be different things, but the notion of quality is very dear to us. Society, social values. Food is a social thing. People like their own food. They think it's theirs. It isn't, actually, but they think it's theirs. Everyone has identity from food. Health, we have to look at food policy through the lens of health. Environment, it would be folly not to take the environment seriously. Not just climate change, biodiversity, land use, all sorts. Of, all of these headings have subheadings under them. Uh, and then obviously the economy. The economy is critical. The politics, the political economy, as we should call it, Economics is a runaway science. It should be returned to what it really was, a moral economy, thinking about what do you want your economy to be. It's not set and run by mathematicians, actually. Get a grip on them. And one of the areas that w where we need to do that in food is the cost of food. Too many things are too cheap in the rich world. The poor world spends a lot of money, 70% of income in a country like Malawi on food. Uh, we in Britain spend 9%, 12% if you include eating out. Uh, this is almost too cheap. No one's paying for the cost of the environment or for health. It's dumped on the other bits. Uh, and th the a good economy of food must get a grip of more than just the price. It must be about good labour, good wages, good working conditions in the food system. And the last heading in my six-heading approach was governance, trust, the, the means of making decisions. That six-heading, I think, is all really available for what I think is now the new framework beginning to emerge. In 1999-2000, the UN system created the Millennium Development Goals. Food was a major theme in those. They've only been partially successful, but at least they tried to drive the sheep of all of us into the same gateway. Uh, the replacements are known as the Sustainable Development Goals, and they're being finalised in 2015. I think we need a food policy for the 21st century, which is around two SDGs. So I want to talk about the other bit in my next talk. Sustainable dietary guidelines for sustainable development goals. So my 21st century food policy is what I call SDG squared. Two sorts of SDGs.
I think if that becomes our framework, that sets the new direction of travel for the food system uh, and, and for us, for consumers. So that's why I'm hopeful. Many of us now know this is the way to go, but this is going to be a power battle to get it.